All right. So, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this discussion on female genital mutilation with Dr. Lori Frazier, who's a pediatrician and an expert on handling child abuse. Uh, first, I'd like to start off by introducing myself. As most of you all know, my name is Hannah Noor, and I'm a second year medical student here at the UCF College of Medicine. And I'm also a critical thinking fellow at the Ion Hirsi Ali Foundation, where as a fellow, I work to advance human rights and freedom both in the United States and around the world uh, with an overall emphasis on nurturing critical thinking. Now, the Ion Hirsi Ali Foundation is a nonprofit organization that works to protect women from genital mutilation, honor violence, and forced marriage with an overall emphasis on liberty for all. Now, of course, this also includes things like freedom of, of expression. Now, this brings us to today's event, which is going to be on female genital mutilation, otherwise known as FGM. And I'd like to now introduce our speaker, who is Dr. Lori Frazier, and thank her for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Lori Frazier graduated from the University of Utah School of Medicine and completed a residency in pedi pediatrics and a fellowship in child abuse at the University of Washington Children's Hospital of Seattle. Now, Dr. Frazier has served as the chair of the section on child abuse and neglect of the AAP and was on the first subboard for child abuse pediatrics at the American Board of Pediatrics. She's also, she, she has been on the board of directors of the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children and is the current chair of the board of directors of the National Center for Shaken Baby Syndrome. Today, she is currently a professor of pediatrics at Penn State Milton Hershey Children's Hospital and division chief of child abuse pediatrics. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm not gonna take much of your time, uh, except to tell you as medical students who I love and have lots of contact with here at Penn State Hershey Children's Hospital and Penn State Hershey College of Medicine, that um, I, I really do enjoy speaking with you about many topics. Child abuse pediatricians are specialists in child abuse and child sexual abuse. And so we have a lot of experience examining children who are sexually abused and have a really in-depth knowledge of genital anatomy and physiology of children, which is not really taught very comprehensively in today's US medical schools. So that's kind of where the area where I come from and talk a little bit more how I got involved in this topic later. So I'm gonna turn it back to you, Hannah. All right, thank you, Dr. Frazier. All right, so next what I'm going to be doing is giving you guys a brief introduction on what FGM is, and then I will hand it over to Dr. Lori Frazier, who will be giving us a presentation. And then at, towards the end, we will have time for a Q&A. Uh, so what is female genital mutilation? As of 1992, it has been officially recognized as a human rights violation by the Uni United Na Nations. Uh, so female genital mutilation refers to the partial or complete removal of the external female genitalia. It is typically done between infancy and age of 18, but adult women all, may also undergo go this procedure. The term FGM refers to any injury to a woman or girl's genitalia for any reason other than medical ones. Now, there are different types. Type one is a clitoridectomy, which is removing part or all of the clitoris. Type two is excision, which is removing part or all of the uh, part or all of the clitoris and the labia minora with or without removal of the labia majora. Type three is infibulation, which is the narrowing of the vaginal opening by creating a seal formed by cutting or repositioning the labia. And type four is all other harmful procedures to female genitals, including pricking, piercing, cutting, scraping, or even burning the area. Now, FGM is often performed by traditional circumcisors or cutters who do not have any medical training. But in some, in some countries, it may be done by a medical professional. Now, anesthetics and antiseptics are not generally used and FGM is often carried out using knives, scissors, scalp, scalpels, or even piece, pieces of glass or razor blades. Now, the girls are forcibly restrained and the experience is painful, traumatic, and degrading. And if the, if the traditional cutter doesn't clean the blade, uh, the, the blade that's used, it can also spread infections like HIV. Now, where does FGM happen? 
FGM happens around the world, but there are certain locations where it's highly concentrated. These include Africa, the Middle East, Malaysia, and Indonesia, but it still happens around the world. Now, this brings us to the United States. In the United States, FGM is rarely given much attention, yet more than half a million women and girls in the U.S. are known to be at risk or having undergone FGM. In this, in this study by the CDC in 2016, it estimated that up to five, 513,000 women and girls from across the United States have undergone or are at risk at FGM. Now, the, the important aspect here is because of cultural restrictions, we don't really know the actual number of victims and at-risk girls. Um, again, it's these cultural restrictions that are, that are impeding the disclosure of this practice. So it, it, we can't really know that for sure. Uh, so this number may actually be higher. Uh, we do know that FGM is not evenly spread out throughout the United States, um, and it is most severe in traditionally isolated and marginalized communities populated by first and second generation immigrants from high prevalence countries. Now, next, I'd like to highlight some of the specific metropolitan areas where there's a high concentration of FGM. These include New York, Newark, New Jersey, Washington, Arlington, Alexandria, and others. So this is happening in the United States. Now, what does the United States think about this? So the United States government opposes FGM regardless of the type, degree, or severity, and the motivation for performing. There are federal guidelines, federal laws against this practice. Performing FGM, FGM on someone under 18 is push, punishable by imprisonment for up to 10 years. Now, religion, custom, or tradition are not a defense to prosecution. and is also a crime to conspire to perform FGM or for a parent or guardian to consent to FGM or take a child overseas for the purpose of this. Uh, so this is a group of medical students. So now we get into a lot of the health consequences. Now there are short-term, long-term, and even psychological consequences of FGM. These can include severe pain, of course, uh, hemorrhage uh, leading to maybe shock and even death, uh, infections, urine, urinary, uh, urine retention, uh, ulceration, wound infection, UTI, fever, septicemia, uh, Dr. Fazer will get more into the clinical side of things, but I just wanted to introduce them here. Now, what about long-term physical consequences? Now, of course, you can have chronic general infections, which can lead to chronic pain, vaginal discharge, itching, cysts, abscesses, uh, and general ulcers. Uh, there can also be UTIs, and these UTIs can eventually um, morph into pyelonephritis. Uh, which can result in renal failure and septicemia and maybe even death. Now, there's also painful, uh, painful urination uh, and menstrual problems, uh, typically or regarding the obstruction of the vaginal opening leading to dysmenorrhea. Um, even keloids are, are an issue here. And of course, female sexual health is also affected. Removal of or damage to highly sensitive genital tissue, especially the clitoris, may affect sexual sensitivity leading to sexual problems and decrease sexual desire and pleasure. Pain during sex, difficulty during penetration, and decreased lubrication during inter intercourse. Now, in addition to this, there are also obstetric comp complications, including increased risk for C-section, postpartum hemorrhage, uh, recourse to episiotomy, uh, difficult labor, and so on. And in addition to this, there are perinatal risks. Uh, now, what, what is it like for the girls and women that undergo this? There's a lot of psychological complications that arise. This is a very traumatic thing that happens. And PTSD can arise, anxiety, depression, reduced social and sexual functioning, and issues around, around uh, trust. The experience becomes a vivid landmark in their mental development the memory of which persists throughout life. And for some, nothing they have subsequently gone through, including pain and stress, and stress in pregnancy, will come close to the painful experience of genital mutilation. Now, where, where, does, where do we come in as medical students and as future physicians? So physicians are indeed mandatory reporters of FGM. Uh, the frontline professional workers are legally required to report when they observe a child being subjected to conditions or circumstances that would reasonably result in abuse. Uh, the mandatory reporting aims to break down the professional barriers regarding confidentiality and cultural sensitivity. 
mitigating any ethical confusion an individual may have. So next thing I'd like to touch on is about this ethical confusion. Does anyone have the right to interfere in age old cultural traditions such as FGM? The short answer, yes. FGM is of course against the law. Moreover, culture and tradition are intended to provide a framework for human well-being, and cultural arguments cannot be used to condone violence against people, male or female. Moreover, culture is not static, but constantly changing and adapting. It's important to respect different cultural backgrounds and religious beliefs. However, this tolerance must not continue at the point where violence, abuse, or oppression takes place. Nevertheless, Tackling the practice of F FGM should be implemented in a way that is sensitive to the cultural and social background of the communities that practice it. Behavior can change when people understand the hazards of certain practices and when they realize that it is possible to give up harmful practices, practices without giving up meaningful aspects of their culture. Now, sometimes people ask if a less severe form of FGM in a medical setting should be acceptable but tolerating medically unnecessary procedures on girls' genitalia creates an ethical slippery slope. It begs the question, how much pain, how much blood, how much of a cut clitoris is enough, and who decides? Bartering with human rights will result in human rights violations. Permitting girls to be subjected to a mild form of FGM or a ritual nick will make it easier for communities to continue the practice in all its forms even the less severe form can cause lifelong harms. Now, next, I have a video Ooh, of FGM next, survivor F.A. Cole we'll sharing her experiences is Dr. Fraser is gonna go problems. ahead and give her presentation on FGM. I was gonna talk a little bit about um, similar things. I'm gonna, I, we had some, Hannah and I had some similar slides um, the, I always have objectives in my slides at the medical school, and you know some of these um, issues already about how FGM has health, sexual, and psychological consequences, where FGM is practiced, and some of the underlying issues. Um, and even though that FGM is practiced in the United States today, despite some federal laws outlining the practice, and the recognition that U.S. trained physicians are not trained to recognize certain types of FGM. And this is especially too, true in children. And because I'm a pediatrician and I deal a lot with genital issues in children, not as a gynecologist, that we understand that pediatric prepubertal anatomy is not well visualized or well understood in most physicians. Um, this is a quote by Wera Steary. She's a Somali model, actress, and founder of another foundation, the Desert Flower Foundation out of Vienna, Austria. She was uh, also cut as, an, as a child. She states that female genital mutilation targets little girls, baby girls, who are helpless, who cannot fight back. It's a crime against a child, a crime against humanity. It's abuse. It's absolutely criminal, and we have to stop it. We know that the World Health Organization has defined female gen genital mutilation, which Hannah has described very well. Um, so infibulation is that more extreme form of closure of the genital area with a small opening. Defibulation is reversing the closure. And there are some places where women ask to be re-infibulated, returning the female anatomy to the infibulated condition. The term medicalization of FGM uh, includes having the procedure performed by a medical provider under stellar conditions with possibly sedation or pain control. And this is the this is the slippery slope, right? Well, I won't subject my child to all the risks of of the of the unsanitary conditions, the conditions of pain and bleeding. We'll do it in a medicalized setting under anesthesia, but it is still a violation of that child's rights because it does compromise her health and well-being moving forward. Uh, we see, we're hearing more and more of FGM as babies because of the baby can't remember, but in general, girls have FGM around five to seven years old, depending on the cultural background of the society where they come from. Traditionally, it's performed with razor blades, glass knives, or non-sterile, even a group procedure. 
um, girls are often told it's special. It's when they're coming to be a woman. It They're usually dressed up and they're excited. They're taken in peer groups. And of course, the first girl is unclear what's going to happen, but the other girls in the group hear the screaming and see the bleeding and also recognize that there's a recent article about sometimes their friends don't make it through the procedure because they hemorrhage to death. I wanted to mention uh, another thing, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 24, which recognized the right of the child to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health and to facilities for the treatment of illness and rehabilitation of health. Part three of Article 24 states that the state's parties shall take all inappropriate measures with a view toward abolishing traditional practices prejudicial to the health of children. And the, this is includes FGM. It includes, um, you know, child marriages. It includes, you know, it, recruiting children into as soldiers in war zones. Anything that's prejudicial to a child, to the health of a child. Um, it's fairly embarrassing uh, for the United States. The United States is the only country in the world which has not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. However, despite a lot of countries ratifying the Convention on the Rights of the Child in Sub-Saharan Africa, in areas of the world where FGM is still practiced, um, they they don't ob abide by the uh, agreements of the Convention. So it's kind of a mixed message. You can ratify it and say, yeah, yeah, ha ha, I ratified it, but then not abide by the uh, by the process of the convention. Once again, um, it's estimated that about 200,000 women and girls that have been subjected to FGM in the U.S. and many more remain at risk because it's still in their cultural context. They also risk being sent to other countries for the procedures because of the deeply, deeply rooted cultural beliefs that this should occur. So, this is a case that I really, um, I had seen a couple of children previous to this in my previous program where I worked, but I got involved because of this case. Um, this was a case of a, a group called the Dawoodi Bora population. It's an Islamic sect from India that practices FGM. And parents were um, taking their children to this clinic in Detroit. It's actually outside of Detroit. And they had a physician uh, that there was a physician licensed in the US who was a member of the group who owned the clinic along with his wife. And then there was a there was an emergency room physician, Dr. Nagarwala, who was also a member of the group who came to the clinic and performed the procedure at the request of the families in a medical sterilized sterile manner, not always with pain control. So um, there was probably someone who told the authorities that this was happening. And uh, there was an investigation that started around 2015, 2016. And the physicians were charged under the federal law against female genital mutilation in Michigan in the Federal District of Michigan. And the next um, thing I'm gonna show you is um, one of the, one of the uh, things from the legal documents that was provided uh, as part of the charging. Um, and this is in the US, this is in 2016 in Detroit. The girls were laid on an examining table, told to put their knees to their chest with their legs spread apart. The doctor pinched them in a place where they pee and there was blood on the examining table, that they were in pain and could barely walk, were given pads to put in their underwear. Both girls were told not to talk about what happened at the clinic by the defendant or their parents. One of the girls, as she was being investigated, told an investigator that she left her winter gloves at the clinic. The glove, which was then retrieved when there was a search warrant exercise to the clinic, had her name in it by the agents, by the FBI. They also had surveillance cameras outside the clinic and they could see the families that came and went. And there were some records kept in the clinic. In all, they, they found about 25 to 26 girls who had undergone various forms of FGM. They um, brought them to a colleague of mine who's a child abuse pediatrician in a children's advocacy center outside of Detroit. 
um, Dr. Dina Nazer, uh, who herself is Muslim and uh, from uh, Lebanon, not she's from Jordan, and um, but doesn't belong to the sect that practices. So there was a sort of a, a cultural context that the physician was also Muslim and very sensitive. She's a very sensitive, compassionate child abuse pediatrician. She was charged with examining all of these girls and determining what type of FGM they had undergone. There were about 26 girls and they ate, ranged in age from about seven to 17 or 18. If they were 18, they had to consent themselves. Because it was part of a criminal investigation, the parents had to comply. And many times they were with their girls when they were having the exams. Um, the other portion that happens in an advocacy center is something called a forensic interview, where an interviewer examines children about their experiences with physical or sexual abuse. Advocacy centers were most often um, started because of sexual abuse. So it, it's very interesting that even though the children were there, that they were seen going in and out, even the child who had her glove found there, many of the children denied they were there or that anything happened. And of course, this was under the influence of their parents. Two beloved physicians in their community were under criminal charges in federal court. Um, and this was the statute in the federal law. It's against U.S. law to perform FGMC, which is sometimes called female genital mutilation or cutting on a girl under the age of 18 or send or attempt to send her outside the United States so it can be performed. And it's violation of the law is punishing up to five years in prison, fines or both. And there's no exception, as Hannah said, for performing FGM because of tradition or culture. And it's, and it's under 18. We know that people over the age of 18 have a right to do whatever they want with their bodies with proper consent. So the, un unfortunately, um, the case was sidelined because a federal judge in the state of Michigan ruled that the federal ban on genital mutilation was unconstitutional and it should go back to the states. Uh, we know how that works because of the over overturning of Roe v. Wade. We know how that works. Then we have a patchwork of laws we don't have a single governing federal law that gives children the right to not have female genital mutilation. So at this time, there were about 24 states that actually had state laws against female genital mutilation. And I don't believe that Michigan did at the time. So it really undermined the entire case. Um, one of the purposes, one of the uh, things that the AHA Foundation has done is advocated very strongly for state laws to be changed. Currently, it's a crime in 41 states. I should more likely give you the states where it does not remain a crime in this moves. I think the 41st state signed it into law just last year. But these are the states now where FGM is not illegal. It needs to be made illegal in all 50 states in the District of Columbia and as well as the territories. So I met um, members from the AHA Foundation in about 20. 17 or 18, when I attended a, a symposium at Penn State Dickinson Law School, which is the law school campus of Penn State. And I was invited um, because this was uh, several law students who were advocates that Pennsylvania become a state, the 34 state to ban FGM. And several legislators were there. And it was a really interesting conference. I gave some of the medical aspects of it because I'd had experience with the case in Michigan. The other part of the case in Michigan that I forgot to mention was Dr. Nazer recruited me and another child abuse pediatrician to secondarily review all of her cases. And as a committee, as a committee of three, we reviewed each one for the types of FGM that maybe was performed on the girls. And it was pretty amazing to us that it was quite variable amongst the girls and it was not uniform. Some had type one, type two, type three. Some had no findings, but probably had some type four with some scraping or pricking or something like that. So, and we still to this day don't know why there was such a variation or whether there was influence of the families of the type of FGM that they'd requested of the physician who was performing it. 
But needless to say that in July 10, 2019, the governor of Pennsylvania made female genital mutilation a felony in Pennsylvania. This was thanks to these really um, committed law students. This is our state law. It's a felony in the first degree, knowing that anyone commits the offense of mutilation, female mutilation if the person knowingly circumcises, excises, and fibrillates the whole or any part of the genitalia of a minor, is the parent of a minor, and the parent knowingly consents or permits circumcision, excision, and fibrillation of the whole or any part of the minor's genitalia, or knowingly removes or permits the removal of a minor from the Commonwealth, that's the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, for the purposes of doing these acts. So we have a pretty strong law in Pennsylvania. I don't know if it's ever been uh, needed yet. I certainly have not seen a child, but I, in my population that I serve, uh, we're not in Philadelphia or in the more populated areas where this is seen. There are exceptions uh, to the circumcision, excision, or infibulation. If it's necessary for the health of the minor, there are certain issues that become important, removal of tumors, cancer, um, uh, labia majora, minora in some adolescents become really hypertrophic and are irritating, and there's a surgical procedure to make it retract that abnormal labia minora. Uh, other genital surgeries may be necessary. And also it's an exclusion if it's, um, if there's something that's performed on a minor in labor who's just given birth for medical reasons connected to the birth or labor by a physician, knowing that sometimes um, there has to be surgical procedures. They didn't wanna have any kind of ex non-exception to certain rules, uh, medical indications for medical procedures. And also our law states that custom or consent is not a defense. And it shall not be a defense to the prosecution of this crime in Pennsylvania if the actor believed the procedure was necessary or appropriate as a matter of custom ritual standard or the minor consented or the minor's parents consented. So it's a pretty strong law against FGM. And I just want to circle back that FGM is really a cultural phenomenon. It is not religious. However, it is part of cultures where virginity and the honor of the family reflecting that virginity is reflect is, is part of that process. Because the underlying idea is that women and girls' sexuality should be suppressed or they may become promiscuous. You know, it's not up to men to hold back their sexuality. It's up to women and girls and their families to protect their sexuality. And, and this is a reflection of that. So as a result, it has come to mean cleanliness and virginity. And in many cultures, girls are not marriageable without FGM. And they, they want the girls and women, their libido to be decreased because they don't want women to enjoy sexual activity because they, of course, then won't be able to control it. They can't con control their sex drives. And then by nature, they will become promiscuous. So it's really tied to that really arcane idea that family honor is tied to the virtue or virginity of the women and girls in their families. And we have to get beyond that. So pediatric approach is a most cutting occurs at seven to 10 years of age, but younger girls and even infants have been reported to be to more easily hide it from authorities and reduce the resistance of the child. It's contrary, as I said, to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, may impact the right to the life and the highest attainable standard of health. And it's a traumatic experience that is physically and mentally abusive and leaves permanent impact on physical, reproductive, and sexual health. What is it specifically? We've gone through some of the ideas, but I, because this is a medical class, I wanted to talk about it. This is um, uh, an anatomic diagram. We're gonna get into some real images. Um, of course, the clitoris is a much more complex structure than just the glands of the clitoris, which you can see right here. This is what's removed because the body of the clitoris is recessed under the clitoral hood and there are suspensory ligaments. We know that the glands of the clitoris, like the glands of the penis, they all have the similar embryologic origination but under X chromosomes, um, 
that is suppressed and it becomes the clitoris. Um, so we know that only the part that comes, um, that's visible through the clitoral hood is often what is excised, but there's many deep parts of the clitoris. There's suspensory organs called the crus of the clitoris. And you can see how close the clitoris is to the urethral orifice and the vaginal orifice. All of these structures can be damaged in the process of a very uh, crude uh, form of cutting. And when girls are held down and their legs are held apart, depending on how old and strong they are, the patient is moving and wiggling and crying. And, and so you can see that other things may happen. Blood vessels can be cut. Here's just a lateral diagram of, of this. And what's really important, um, I'm not an expert in by any means of, of clitoral reconstruction, but when it happens, there has to be some body of the clitoris that still remains and it's pulled through to be exposed to try and restore that um, sexual function and sensitivity of the clitoris. But the glands is the most clitoral, is the most uh, sensitive structure and it's, it's equivalent to the glands of the penis, which nobody would want cut off. So I'm gonna review pre-pubertal pre genital anatomy because you don't get that kind of review in medical school, at least in the five medical schools that I have taught in. And I think it's really important to understand how children are different. And I'm just going to show you that these are the parts, the clitoral hood. Here, uh, you can't see the glands because in most children, the clitoral hood is covering the glands of the clitoris and it has to be retracted to expose it. Occasionally, we'll see it exposed during our examinations, but really we were never taught when we were doing these examinations when I was training as a specialist in this area to actually retract the hood of the clitoris back and see the glands. It didn't seem to be that important. The labia minora in a child are small. They're, they look like this. They're, they don't come all the way around to what we call the posterior fourchette. The urethra is a small dimple here. You don't really see it as an opening typically. And this is the hymen right here. It can vary in structure and anatomy from child to child. This is a normal hymen. It has a sharp margin. It's not a complete blockage of the vagina as some people think. But you can see, and here's the vagina. It, we don't often see very well into the vagina in prepubertal children. And sometimes it looks a little more closed. We'll show you a picture of that. But there's almost always an opening. Occasionally, very rarely, a, a girl can be born with an imperforate hymen, or there's very rare genetic syndromes where the entire vagina does not develop. And that's called vaginal agenesis, or the syndrome of Rokitansky, Rokitansky Kuster, and Hauser. So the next one is gonna show you some normal genital changes from early childhood and birth. So less than two years, the clitoris is, looks a little bigger than later because as a girl is born, she's under the influence of her maternal estrogens. And this is a child who has some pigmentary changes, which often little girls of color who have pigment will be born with some pigmentary changes of their genitalia, which may remain or it may go away. In this girl, the hymen looks closed, but if it's just covered by these little leaflets of hymen that can be pulled aside, there is a hymenal opening. But as the effects of estrogen decrease, at about school age, here's another totally normal prepubertal child's exam. Here's her hymen, it's a little thicker. You can barely see into her vagina, her, clitor her, uter oh, sorry. Excuse me. her urethra's here and the clitoris isn't well visualized. And the, the peri, the labia minora are small. As girls go through puberty and attain their own estrogen, the genital exam changes. The labia majora become longer and cover the vaginal opening when closed. And they can become pigmented. They become slightly rugated. If you think about male uh, progression through puberty, the scrotum becomes rugated. And you can see the hymen also changes. It becomes paler under estrogen effect. It becomes thicker. It becomes less sensitive to touch. And in this particular one, it's totally normal, but in some teenagers and adults, it's it becomes more 
overlapping leaflets of tissue and not so obvious of an opening, although there still is, as long as there's menstruation. The other um, thing that happens to the prepubertal, uh, in the pubertal sense, is the hymen loses its sensitivity to touch and pain sensation. In prepubertal girls, when we examine them, we can't touch their hymens, or they'll become exquisitely pain painful. They will just cry, and we can't do anything else. So, however, that changes under the influence of estrogen as we prepare for sex and childbirth and other things. So, this is a Going into the anatomy, this is a 16-year-old Somali refugee who presented to our emergency department with a complaint of vaginal penile assault. And um, she was seen by some sexual assault nurse examiners who are good at collecting evidence and advocating for patients, but they did not understand her anatomy. Um, she had limited pubic hair. She had very small labia majora. And, and when they spread apart the labia majora to see what the um, vagina looked like, this is what they found. And I was the medical director. They immediately sent the pictures to me. And I said, this is, this is a girl who's had type 3 female genital mutilation. It was likely she had it before she immigrated from Somalia because she hadn't been in the country very long. And it was likely it occurred at a much younger age. You can see she has no clitoris and just this scar tissue, which covers the vaginal opening. There's no vaginal opening that you can see. It's behind there. And then there's a small posterior opening that is left for the uh, for pain, for menses and urine. And you can see that if menses are blocked or urine is blocked, there's so many risk factors that this girl could be subjected to. And when she gets married and has her first intercourse, uh, it's either the male has to force his penis through that tiny opening and tear open the infibulation. Or in some cultures, the men are given a razor blade to cut it open again so the girl can have sex with them. So it's really a brutal thing. This is a four-year-old Egyptian girl. A, a colleague of mine gave me this photo. It's a little bit different. She has no clitoris. She's infibulated uh, with an anterior opening. Um, obviously, this is a very destructive procedure. Now, we referred the 16-year-old Somali girl, we referred her to GYN to uh, consider giving her options of defibrillation. I, I honestly don't know what happened. I would like to have known. So this is another case. This is uh, from a recent clinical statement, which we'll talk about from the American Academy of Pediatrics. This is... Um, uh, an image that is copyrighted by the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics. And you can see the complete closure uh, of the labia majora now, minora. Now she does have a little bit of labia minora here, which is interesting. Sometimes it's hard to see how much labia minora has been removed because once this is healed, um, there is a variation in the amount of labia minora that girls may have, and some have very small ones and some have bigger ones. So when we were reviewing the cases from Detroit, it, and there were a few cases that we couldn't tell if they'd had some reduction or change in their labia minora because they still were within the range of normal. And once they go through puberty, the tissue will change and grow once again. We talked about this a little bit. Not only is the immediately short-term uh, complications, injury to all the adjoining areas, anemia from hemorrhage or death from hemorrhage, infection, and not only transmission of HIV, but other hepatitis, B and C, and, and death. So it's, it's a bad procedure. A lot of long-term complications. We uh, had a, a touched on this obstetrical complications. Um, in 2010, the American Academy of Pediatrics issued a fir their first statement about the risk of harm of genital cutting. They sort of waffled a little bit and left a piece of it to say, well, maybe we should allow a small prick or less damaging procedures so that families don't ask for the more serious procedures. The problem was that caused an enormous backlash um, and so the AP retracted their policy. 
and it, re it received a large backlash from a community of advocates who are trying to stop female genital mutilation or any kind of activity altogether. The to AAP is totally opposed to all forms of female genital mutilation, both here in the US and that was the president of the AAP. So there's a clinical report through the American Academy of Pediatrics that was published in 2020. It's open, it's a public facing document. All the clinical reports are policy statements. You can go to the AAP and just Google FGM and you'll get the full PDF of this. This is a clinical report is the first comprehensive summary of FGMC in children includes education regarding the standard of care approach for examination of external female genitalia at all health supervision examinations, which I can guarantee you does not happen. People are fearful of looking at the genitals of children in their health supervision or their well child examinations. There seems to be a much stronger resistance to do this. Therefore, pediatricians and, and other people charged with examining children for well child visits do not even know what's normal, let alone what's abnormal. But also, if it's in the population where you have a population where children are at risk, it's important to make that diagnosis, talk about complications management treatment in a culturally sensitive way and counseling approaches in legal and ethical ways. This is just from the statement. It basically shows the age of FGM in different countries. And it's on the statement. You can see that some countries are the very youngest all the way up to Kenya. These are slightly older girls all the way up to over 15. This is maternal report of the age of girls who've undergone FGM in the countries with obviously very young girls undergoing it. Acute FGM effects may be, rarely be seen in children in the US as children may be sent back to their countries for the medicalized procedure. And it's likely a child from the appropriate community may only be seen when FGM concerns are raised or other symptoms may be present. Sometimes somebody doesn't understand their anatomy and they're referred uh, for the assessment of sexual abuse. Um, and they're not that obvious depending on the non-acute phase unless there's type three and the vagina is sealed. Often adult professionals or clinicians who are working with adult immigrant populations, midwives and OBGYNs may be more familiar with the issues of type three because of they can be pregnant and still have a pretty sealed over uh, vagina. And it's, it's very rare in my experience in child sexual abuse examinations to carefully examine for the presence of a clitoris, as I said. Trained examiners in general assessment of children should be the evaluators of these children. And in this country, they are child abuse pediatricians. We use magnified devices or like the colposcope to do external magnification or other photo documentation. And like my colleague in Detroit who did fabulous exams that were actually videotaped, we got together virtually and we evaluated each one of those examinations to determine the type of FGM. We know that maybe children of women who've undergone FGM is still at risk, and education still remains a very culturally sensitive issue, talking to them. If it's performed in the US, it should be considered child abuse and reported to the authorities. If it's performed prior to coming to the US, culturally sensitive educations on the options available to women and children should be explored. They won't be prosecuted or considered abused if there's a lot of evidence that it is performed prior to immigration. Removal of scar tissue as treatment, defibrillation, clitoral reconstruction is a somewhat controversial procedure. I don't know where it stands today because it's an, a, a specialized procedure and the mental health treatment. This is from the AP article, which shows a massive cyst where the clitorectomy was performed. And um, this is a, actually a Tanner stage five female patient where the treatment of the cyst, it had to be removed with reconstruction. So it's, it's, a, it's a major, major issue. There's continued advocacy for these minor procedures when, when this came out in the New York Times. This woman from Texas, Nira Mirza, she's a member of the community that practices in India, the Dawoodi Bora religious sect, and she's spoken out to prevent female genital mutilation of the children. And of course, she has a daughter in the background and, and she really felt that she wanted to speak out to help prevent what happened to her. I think the most powerful messages are from the community itself, like, like you saw in the video earlier. 
Uh, this was <laughs> something that caught my eye on March 7th, 2024 in the New York Times that states female genital cutting continues to increase worldwide. Um, talking about campaigns in some countries have reduced the practice, but it remains widespread with high rates of population growth. So, you know, we're really still in a difficult time in many of the cultures and countries that have this practice. I'm not gonna play this because we don't have time. This is a, a YouTube video and I can share the link. Um, it was made by the Dabuti Bora community against FGM. It includes men, fathers, brothers, as well as women. And I think this is where uh, we have to have uh, the cultural focus. You know, some old white woman from Pennsylvania probably won't have as much effect as, as people from their own communities. So thank you so much for listening. I'm, I think we have 10 minutes for questions. We really wanted to save that time for questions and uh, let me know what you think. Thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Frazier. Uh, so now we're gonna open it up to a Q&A and you guys can go ahead and raise your hands and I'll walk around and hand you the mic. Uh, hi, Dr. Frazier. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. This is a topic I'm really interested in, and um, I feel like I learned a lot. <clears throat> uh, my question is, what um, types of education are usually provided um, when speaking to women and children and families about this topic? Thank you. So I don't think there's much education unless you unless there's a population of immigrants who come from one of the communities where it's practiced. I don't think we're educated we're doing much good at educating at all, especially in our typical medical school residency type situations. It sort of requires an interest and align yourself with a mentor who has some practice interests. There's a listserv called, um, that I'm on called Female Genital Mutilation Listserv. It, and there's actually, it's all adult physicians, OBGYNs and family practice doctors who are involved in the medical side for women who are having reproductive and, and healthcare problems as a result. Um, so it's really align yourself with a, somebody who can. There are some communities that have been known to practice FGM in the United States who are white Christian communities, part of the same reasons that occur. And if any of you watched that film that got an Oscar called um, Poor Thing, and at near the end, they're going to take this woman protagonist by Emma Stone because she has these sexual proclivities. They're going to take her and cut off her clitoris to make her more submissive. And you see that right at the end of the film. And I don't know if people picked up on that. They had a special tool that this doctor was showing to her evil husband. Anyway, so it, it's just sort of a smattering of things that like people don't want to hear about it unless they want to hear about it. Hi, Dr. Frazier. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I had a question um, regarding like the victims of FGM. Are, are they typically going to the OBGYN and getting their pap smears and all that? Or is it the first time that they like see a provider when they're pregnant? It may be the first time they see a provider when they're pregnant. Uh, so I would those are the ones that we hear about on the FGM listserv. Um, there are some community clinics. There's one in Philadelphia where they really cater to this population. I think if they come in for their health care, then it's probably detected. Or like our 16-year-old Somali girl, she came because she was sexually assaulted. She couldn't have vaginal penetration, right? She could have genital penetration, however slight, which is the definition of rape. So it wasn't that she wasn't raped. It's just that the scar tissue presented her from, prevented her from having vaginal penetration. So um, I don't, I mean, I don't know how often they come in. I mean, from the immigrant communities to get routine health care, but certainly it's often picked up uh, when they're coming in for prenatal care or in labor. Some people don't get prenatal care. Thank you. And a follow-up question. Um, I don't know if you have these statistics on hand, but I'm just curious how many 
women are victims of FGM actually undergo the defabulation surgeries? I don't actually have an answer to that because it's not the population that I deal with. It might be really good to have some of these people come, one of the OBGYN groups come, Renit Mishwari or others. Um, on, on the AAP article, um, one of the authors is Nawal Noor. Nawal is a OBGYN who I, I knew she is Egyptian and uh, trained in the U.S. I think she became chair of OBGYN at Brigham and Women's in Massachusetts, one of the Harvard hospitals. I had contacted her once about a child I saw when I was at a previous institution, but I didn't show her pictures, and she helped me work it out. So she does a lot of that work. She's done a lot of that work in the countries where it's practiced, and she's been pretty effective because of her culture and her background and her knowledge of this procedure and her ability to correct it as a as a as a gynecological surgeon uh, and an OB. So uh, I don't know the answer to your question. Let's just tap on. Oh, whoops, sorry. All right, thank you so much uh, for. Um, coming in to talk to us. I just had like a question just kind of like on the provider side because like we're all medical students here. So how do you generally recommend someone in training or someone like as a physician would go about approaching having these type of conversations uh, with a victim for FGM? So I think it's really challenging because you're not, I, I guarantee as a student, your preceptors in these clinics, unless you're in a specialized area, you have a preceptor who has an interest in this, or you're working with a refugee or immigrant population that may have been at risk for these procedures. So outside of those situations, uh, I would expect your preceptor wouldn't also have a lot of experience. And I think you just have to ask in a very culturally sensitive way. I had one situation here uh, in Pennsylvania where the general pediatrician was seeing a 12-year-old girl for... Um, she was having urinary problems and they are from sub-Saharan Africa. And the pediatrician was worried that maybe she'd had a procedure. So um, we, she, she wanted to examine the girl, but to make sure that this was her, her medical issues weren't related to any kind of previous cutting, but she didn't know what she was going to look at. So I went to the clinic. We spent a lot of time talking to the mother and the girl and allaying their fears and the mother couldn't tell me or wouldn't tell me if she had been subject to the procedure. So we examined the girl. She looked perfectly fine to me. I don't think she had the procedure, but it allowed us to say, well, it's not whatever happened to her previously that's causing her urologic problems. So it's a hard conversation to have. There are some conferences where this is discussed. There are some, they're more um, in Europe in England, in some of the other countries where there's higher immigrant populations are more aware of these things. So it's hard to have the conversation. It falls into the category of difficult conversations where you want to be culturally sensitive and talk about the reasons why you, you know, want to help the patient. You don't, and you certainly patients over the age of 18 who might need medical care are totally able to obtain that. You might talk to those who are younger, the parents, and tell them they'll need to come back later. We wouldn't do any kind of corrections on children before they were 18 unless they were having medical issues at the time or when they got to be adolescents. So I can't give you a good answer on that. It's a hard question to talk about. Thank you, Dr. Frazier. I just have one last question before we close out. Uh, as we stated, this is a group of medical students, first and second years, and having you as a child abuse expert here, I'd love to know any tips you have for spotting child abuse or anything that will help us as future physicians in doing that. Oh boy, I just gave that talk. It was a whole hour long, uh, hour and a half to my, uh, I, we do a talk for, it's called transition to clerkship and our clerkship now goes as a month of peds, a month of OB and a month of family medicine. So we do a talk on violence through the lifespan. I would just say that as man mandatory reporters of child abuse, you know, physical abuse, you have to look for unusual bruises and injuries to children, especially the youngest ones, the babies who aren't walking or mobile. You should always have a connection.
through your medical school or program to have a child abuse expert. Florida has a unique system of child protection teams. There is someone in Orlando County or wh whatever county you're in that I know that you can talk to um, at the children's hospital there. Um, I'm very familiar with many of the child abuse specialists in Florida. Sexual abuse is hard because someone has to raise a concern of physical symptoms or a child might be telling a parent all of these things, they're reported to mandatory authorities. We always advocate that we tell parents, we have this concern about your child. We need to make a child abuse report based on the law in this state and the policies of this institution. We just need to make sure that your child is okay. Our policy is never to accuse a family, but to say we're reporting in the best interest of a child. And that way, the authorities have CPS in Florida, I think it's called DFCS, has the ability to refer those children to the proper medical providers who can do the right kinds of exams. So that's the key is to have those links and liaison with your specialist. Like if you had a kid who had like, you heard a giant weird murmur, you would want to know what pediatric cardiologist to refer that child to. And that's the same for child abuse pediatrics. We are specialty of pediatrics. We are board certified in child abuse pediatrics and pediatrics. So that's the specialty route that you go. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us today, Dr. Frazier. And thank you to you all for taking time out of your day to learn about this very important topic. Uh, thank you.